postprandial somnolence. It's <laughs> <laughs> a fancy way of saying you know, sleepy after you eat. That's why I went to veterinary school for those high-tech terms. Um, so now we have the great pleasure of uh, having Dr. Uh, Arjuna Kapoor present on uh, Luminex assay validation. This is no small feat, uh, especially as you go into these multiplex, and as I said before, it's not just uh, validating a multiplex assay, it's validating each of the components and the idiosyncrasies of each of them. So. Marjana? Well, thank you, John. Um, thanks for coming. And I would say, yeah, after food you do get sleepy, but I, I hope you all have that nice cookie, and you're going to be all strong with questions. So please interrupt me if you have any questions. I think this is a very informal meeting, and I will talk to you about them while I'm giving a talk. So. Initially, um, I don't know how many of you uh, know this, but Sonal was supposed to present. Uh, she's not here um, because of some family reasons, so I'm, I'm taking over. So I hope I'll do a justice to her talk. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about uh, Luminex assay validation. And just as a background, I know everybody knows about Luminex, but just to start, uh, Luminex is a bead-based sandwich ELISA and it is based on the principles of flow cytometry. The difference uh, Luminex has from flow cytometry is that it uses a single 5.6 uh, micron size microsphere or the bead. And these beads are dyed with red and infrared dyes in different combinations. And it's that different combination of these dyes that you can create approximately 500 unique uh, beads. And each bead is conjugated to a specific target in light or your capture antibody. The assay is very simple and this is how it works. You choose your analyte specific bead and you design the assay. You incubate your samples with these beads. You add the biotinylated antibody. You add the PE and then you acquire and analyze the data. So what are the advantages? Dan mentioned in his talk just before uh, the launch that it, it is highly specific. It is highly sensitive. And you, you, you actually use low sample volumes, which is very critical for the clinical trials when you're having or you have a a patient sample, where you cannot get enough patient sample. And because you're multiplexing, it's cost effective. So what are the applications? You can use it in clinical diagnostic, life sciences, clinical research, and also biosurveillance. So what is the role of Cambridge Biomedical in assay validation? You all know we are a um, contract research organization and we provide bioanalytical services to life science companies. But what sets us apart from other CROs is that we are CLIA CAP GLP GCLP compliant. And this is the key. Um, John just gave a talk, you know, you have to follow the rules. And because of this compliance, we offer services to support the clinical trials and post-market studies under the guidance provided by the FDA. That's the key. Come to us. You, you want to validate any assay, come to us. So what are the components that you need for any assay validation? You need reagents and kits. You can uh, use ready-to kits provided from the vendors like over here. Or, I'm sure Jim Ledver, he would actually watch, watch for the in-house color kit. <laughs> Say, no, use the in-house color kits. And actually, we have done that. He's a great collaborator. The instrument and the software. The instrument has to be validated. The software. The software has to go through the 21 CFR part and find uh, compliance. You don't have a software and a validated instrument, you're not doing validation. 
optimization. Even you get kids from uh, like ready to use kids, you still need to optimize the asset. You still need to know what are the components, are what are the tweaks that you need to do before you begin your validation. Then validation begins, and this is what we test. We test our sensitivity, the precision, the robustness, the recovery, accuracy. We develop reference ranges for the controls. There's a drug interference that need, you need to test, the dilution studies that need to be done, <coughs> and you test for the stability of the samples. You need to know if you, are, if you have a sample that you tested a year ago, and you test a year later, <coughs> did you get accurate, stable results or not? Very important. And then comes the implementation. After you validate, you need to implement the validated assay in clinical sample testing. So my talk is going to be focused on Luminix assay validation. And I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that we face during Luminix assay validation. And also provide some recommendations. Not FDA recommendations, <laughs> but our recommendations that we have actually observed while running this, uh, the test again and again and again in several different studies. So the most important thing is positive samples. Think about it. You have 15 different cytokines to test. You need those couple of samples that are positive for all those 15 cytokines. What are you supposed to do? Are you going to screen hundreds of uh, people before you get those positive samples? Because you need that one sample. It's multiplexing. You need that one sample to be positive for all those 15 cytokines that you're going to validate. So how, how do you get there? So this is what we recommend. And this is often we do that if you are validating inflammatory cytokines, they are published methods. So if there is a published method that can give you a positive sample, go ahead and use it. And one of the common methods that we use is from current protocols in immunology. And uh, it's, uh, the title is whole blood stimulation. Okay? So this is how it's done. You obtain whole blood, you add the stimulant, be it derived from a plant or bacterial derived stimulant, and then you add concentrations of pH and LPS for a certain number of hours, and you incubate it. You spin, collect the samples uh, that you need, the plasma samples, and you store them in single-use early parts. And then you test did you get all those 15 cytokines that you need to measure within that stimulated protocol? But look at these. Look at the question marks. Here, here. Are you going to use just PHA or LPS? Both of them. This is what we see. You use PHA, you regulate certain cytokines, not all. You use LPS, it down regulates certain sort of kinds that PHA upregulates, and, and, and it doesn't stimulate all other cytokines that you're interested in. What concentration are you going to test? There are going to be different concentrations for uh, PHA and LPS. Yes? Can I have a question now? Yeah. Can you just find the becoming a protein? Yeah. Good one. We tried it. It does works. Work. Yeah. Oh. It works. You know the problem is? Uh -huh. You cannot do a freeze thaw on them. So your, in, yeah, your, your intra assay is going to work perfect. What is going to fail is your inter assay precision and your stability. So there's a problem. Yes, your, uh, your, uh, your intra assay is perfect. So why, why can't you just bite me to the serum of whatever, some plasma, yeah. then I'll code? Yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. a problem. That, yes, 
because you have so uh, you take your sample, you take your sigma samples, you take your recombinant cytokines, you spike them, you do you freeze them down, you make one in record and you freeze them down. But what will happen is that when you do that, it that sample goes to the freeze thaw cycle, it loses the activity. You don't get the same result. You have to do you have to check your freeze thaw stability during the stability testing validation. It'll fail. So the other person who was talking one mm -hmm. he had hundred enzymes for yeah. and he was doing So that's enzyme activity. It's not cytokines, and uh, I think uh, I cannot vouch for the enzyme activity. But I, uh, you know, days days ago, years ago, I was working with enzymes, and I know that they lose uh, activity, uh, you know, depending on how you store them. So that storage is very important. Another thing is that uh, you were storing it in gestalt. Yeah. There is we have to spike it in plasma or serum, the sample which is coming from the patient. So, matrix is going to be there. So, if that for the So, along the same lines, though, why do you think you're able to store the stimulated cell, the stimulated serum, and not have a freeze thaw cycle? versus the recombinant proteins that them Yes, uh, so because uh, these are uh, naturally produced, and they actually mimic, uh, so whatever cytokines that are produced are produced within that matrix effect, and they remain stable. But what's your suggestion for those, you know, not inflammatory cytokines? How do you get the nature of, you know, control? We are looking for the answer too. <laughs> you get one, share it with us. <laughs> yeah, and then that's the problem. These aren't all, just as he said, uh, Dan said in his talk. You know, some of them reacted very well, were you know active for a year, no no diminution of activity, whereas other ones fell apart. And that's one of the differences when you're doing these validations. You have to do it in the matrix, and even some of the kits and everything else may be validated for serum. But the sponsor comes along and says, no, we don't want that in serum. We want it in plasma or CSF or something else. And that really adds the, the issue. If you could put it in glycerol, if you could do a one-to-one -one spike and everything else, you'd probably do it. But you'd have to incorporate it in your SLP as you're going along for validation. And also, if you are actually validating your assay where you are storing your samples in glycerol, patient samples need to be stored in glycerol. Mm -hmm. So, not everything is practical. So let's talk about lower limit of connotation. According to FDA, the lowest standard of, on the calibration curve should be accepted as the lower limit of connotation if the lowest standard is at least five times the response as compared to the blind response. And this is what we have observed that this FDA recommended lower limit of quantitation at least five times as compared to the blend does not always apply to the luminex assays. And what we have observed is that most of the times, if not all, it's only 1.5 to three times the blind value or the limit of detection. The accuracy. Accuracy is determined by spatting a known amount of the analyte into the sample, be it plasma or serum. And if the recovery is between 70 to 130 percent of the spike concentration, the result is considered accurate. So we just talked about uh, matrix effect. It's there. Can you get rid of it? Yeah, you can. By diluting the plasma samples. Does it always work? No? You know what? Again, think about it. There are 15 different cytokines. Five of them are going to work at a dilution of one to two and give you that accurate result. Another five are going to work at a dilution of one to five. Some you dilute, 
you lose the signal because they are so low, they are so close to the lower limit of connotation. You cannot dilute them. So, are you going to run the patient samples at three different dilutions? Why not? Cost? Yeah, why not? Each kit, so uh, that's the whole thing. Each kit has, you know, multiple. Either you actually um, take individually, you validate individually, and you determine that dilution factor that's going to give you um, the dilution factor and say give you accurate results. Then you develop a kit for five cytokines, not 15. But it's the same plasma sample. Remember, we are multiplexing. Yeah. So when you say it works, yes. when doing the dilution, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that so, spike in recovery in those yes. samples is good? Yes. yes. Okay. So because you're diluting, when you are diluting down the sample, you and you do a spike in recovery, you can actually recover between the recommended 71 30 percent. So that means whatever result that you will get from a patient sample when you do the analysis, you will get an aggregate result. Okay. So, and so if you dilute, I mean, I mean, I know for some analytes you have to dilute one to twenty to remove the matrix effect. But then, uh, so this is the whole thing. FDA says. When you are uh, actually validating an assay or testing the assay, you should have at least 90% of your matrix. You have 1 to 20 dilution, you don't have that 90% matrix in there. Yeah, you'll get an accurate result, but not with the matrix. So, what we often suggest and recommend is to, if accuracy fails, and you are not able to validate all those 15 cytokines in one run or one assay. You run a baseline sample, and then you evaluate the differences between the pre and the post uh, treated samples. So that you can get a sense of, uh, you have a clinical trial, uh, you are using a drug, is it actually working? So it's gonna give you a ratio not accuracy. Precision. FDA describes precision as the closeness of individual measures of an ally when the procedure is applied repeatedly. And that precision has to be in between, that's 15 to 20 percent CV. Does it work? No. We there are certain analytes that they consistently fall outside this recommended precision range of 15 to 20 percent. Here's an example. So the table shows inter acid precision of cytokine 1 and 2. The experiment was done six times, different days, different experiments, two different operators. And look, cytokine 1, the precision is 20%. No, and the value is not even close to the lower limit of quantitation where it can be 20%. Mm -hmm. Cytokine 2, yeah, within that uh, precision range of 15%. Can be, and most likely it is close. It is not that LLQ, but close to the LLQ. So well within that range. <coughs> So this is what we would like to recommend for luminix access to 25% and 30%. And when you are interpreting the results, you interpret them based on the known decision of the asset determined during validation. Stability. So an analyte is considered stable if the difference between the baseline sample and the stored sample is within plus and minus 30% or that relative error. And stability is dependent on several conditions. The storage, the collection, the transportation, the freestyle cycles that it goes through during testing, the duration of the study, how long has the sample been stored? 
And this is what we observe, that there are certain cytokines that they wobble from being that stable to unstable and back to that stable state. Here's an example. So this table shows stability of cytokine 1 and 2, and they were stored at minus 80 degrees Celsius. No freestyle cycle here. So that's the baseline, one month. Cytokine 1 and 2, the relative error is 31%. Well, outside the recommended uh, precision range or the relative error range described by FDA. But look what happens, three months, they're back. They're back to that acceptance criteria. So what do you do? Report the sample being unstable at one month, stable at three months, not use the data at one month, or you continue a stability study. Take the sample being as stable. How do you know it's not the kid itself? Yeah, good question. Because, <laughs> Uh, because, um, so this is, uh, I'm sure people here would uh, tell, uh, you know, would probably answer this question better, but uh, the kit stability is done by the manufacturer. And, and we also uh, look for the standard curve and the mean fluorescence intensities, and it, as long as they are within that 10, 15% range, they are stable. So we actually look for um, you know, the stability studies of the kid in-house too. So if the kid, if the kid was, was different, if the standard curve varied from the initial baseline, do you factor that into your, um, yeah, to your so, so, so this is why, this is one of the recommendations we always uh, tell the kid manufacturer is that when they, that they should be minimum lot to lot variation. Right. These studies were done with a single log. So this is a single log, and you can still see the variability. But here's the point. Look at the interacid precision of cytokine 1 and 2. For all these runs, the interacid precision is 17 and 14%. Well within that interacid precision, or the variability of between run-to-run, day-to-day variation. Stability didn't fail at one month. It passed. Because you see this variation from run-to-run, run and from day-to-day, day from operator to operator. So what is the recommendation? We would like to recommend that the precision of the assay should be considered when interpreting stability results. We use both person RD as well as the person CV for stability studies. Unless there is a trending of the data that clearly shows that the sample is taking stability. So if you constantly see that, you know, within one month, the person RD increased, within the second, third month it increased, fourth month it increased, yeah, sample failed but not when it is within that person, uh, the inter precision, because that's a day-to-day -day one variability. So what are we going to, going to conclude? Yeah, multiplexin is, it's a great technology. We love it. it this is what the era is. And, the, and we all know that uh, the advantages are high throughput, lower cost, and the most important thing is use of smaller sample volumes. We, we need that. But in spite of their advantages over single plex, we still need to address these challenges. And we, we need to address them because we have to use them under that regulated environment. And these recommendations that we have, they have been accepted by our clients because we discussed it with them. I mean, those guidances are there, we have to follow them, but things are changing. Things are moving fast, and we, we would like to say that we have to move, the technology has to move, the guidance also has to move with the technology. 
So, thank you. Yep. Do you see the metrics issue when you use the Luminax for your task? How do you solve the problem? Yeah, so generally, you know, uh, the matrix effect is there sometimes, yes, sometimes no. And uh, so generally, we, so when we are looking for that matrix effect, we are actually doing the spike and recovery to see is it accurate or not. And then if we don't get an accuracy, there is a matrix effect. So usually, like you said that you know, when you dilute the samples, you can just overcome this problem. So usually what dilution you use for the luminance? It actually depends. That's exactly what I was talking about. Certain cytokines, you have to dilute the samples at one to two. Some others, you have to dilute one to five. I mean, you said one to twenty. <laughs> so it, it varies. Yeah. You brought up a couple of different things that I didn't, I wasn't aware of. Number one, the FDA has guidance for 90% of the matrix. 95%. 95% of what you ask, it has yes. to be. Yes, the matrix the should, 95% off should be the matrix. So that means that whenever you were doing, whenever you dilute serum or plasma, one to two, we're not following the FDA guidelines? Uh, but that is actually how the kit is manufactured. So you are counting for that dilution over there. I mean, you cannot run any sample. So you can't find the dilution. But to remove the matrix effect, it has to be done prior to testing. So you have to have the plasma diluted one to two, and then you're further diluting for the assay another half time, because it's half and half. Half of your assay diluent and half of your sample. Then the other thing is, does the FDA have guidelines for normalization between assays? Because you brought up, she brought up a very important point, which is there's there's going to be batch effects from, from day to day and mm -hmm. operator yes. variants and things like that. Yes. So does the FDA have recommendations for multiplexing for... Uh, well, for so, so this is the whole thing. They don't have particularly for multiplexing. And uh, they have guidance for bioanalytical, you know, testing, but not multiplexing as such. They have guidance for ELISA. And I think most of the guidances that were transferred were directly from the ELISA testing over to multiplexing. And they don't really apply to it. So NAS guidance was finalized, was I think in 2001? Yes, 2001. I don't think multiplexing even existed at that time. So there are draft guidance which haven't been finalized yet, but even those didn't include the But it's all. even there, they are not actually uh, Pointing on multiplexing. So, you know, go for it. so if there if there was available like a matrix solution for handling matrix, uh, how beneficial would that be, and uh, how much would you be willing to pay for that as an additional cost to your asset? Yeah, but uh, remember, yeah, if, we, if there was that a is, solution, and yeah. I'm going to say that we might have. One. Yeah, so, you know, we know, I don't know whether it's the same magic solution or not, but you have that, you can remove the globulins and you can, you can have strip the plasma sample. But remember, everything has to be done, once you validate, it has to be applied to the patient samples. Correct. How many patient samples are you going to use that magic solution to? Correct. It has to be a standard procedure. Correct. Once the sample is to, collected. You'd have to send it out in yeah. a kit for quite <clears throat> So this would be something that would be totally validated, provided yes. as a kit to be incorporated as part of that particular assay kit, whether it's a commercial kit or whether it's something that you develop as an LDT. Um, I'm asking a question because it's come up a lot. We'd love to try. Um, well, I can't wait a few weeks. <laughs> but I've, I've had you guys on my radar screen for that particular reason. That's why I brought it up to, to the group here because it, there is a matrix effect that affects not just Luminex, it's every assay out there. Yeah. Um, so. And you ever wondered why a serum sample doesn't dilute out linearly when you dilute it out? Some other vendors, some other technology platforms seems that they commercially available. There are a lot of solutions commercially available to to, to conquer the, the metrics issue. I don't know whether the Luminax has the same thing. Like uh, I know the MSDECL they have maybe 30, 40 percent of different buffers for you to try 
Correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah no, these were the questions I want to ask. What you yeah, want is the one solution. Yeah. The, what, we're, what we found in the market is, is you, you have to have one solution for the very reason of validating assays. Uh, so there's, there's, there, there are different ways of, of dealing with matrix effects. And uh, what we're doing at Luminex now, just so you're aware, we're evaluating several technologies, many of which you're probably not even aware of, uh, to be able to handle that. And so we have very, very stringent validation uh, protocols in place and working uh, with companies. Some of them are here in the Boston area. Uh, and it's pretty exciting to see some of the data and some of the claims that some of these matrix solutions claim aren't true. And so we're trying to sort through that before we get to these LDTs where the guidelines come out and one company makes a claim as a reagent that removes matrix effect and it's not true. Well, well to, and to your point, if you think of the MSD and some of the other technologies that are out there that are doing multiplexing, they're not quite as far along in their quest for clinical um, validity. So those solutions may not go through down the road when they get to that point. Right. Whereas the Luminix technology from all of the companies that, that partner with them are already there. You know, we already have that regulatory compliance going on, so. Well, this is more like, you know, LDT, that we're going to develop this test in the lab, and we need to, we'll see these kind of problems. Right, right. Yeah. To yeah. And you'll so figure out for your particular assays, and that's what we'll, we'll help with now, but I'm hoping that by the time we do it, we want to get with you. Okay, we'll some of this other stuff we can try. Or at least someone else will try it, and we'll say, hey, we've got a solution for that. Right. Here's, I mean, Reagent A. <laughs> this would be manipulation of the sample itself. Correct. It's sample, it's sam all, all, I think it all comes down to the sample prep. Yeah. But we even see it in molecular diagnostics where we're looking at DNA variants for cytochrome P450s, for example, and we're looking at metabolism. metabolism. That's pretty, pretty prominent in that world. You do warfarin testing, for example. I think that's pretty accurate, right? Well, there is a sample matrix effect there as well. It's more in the proteome that we see it, it's more prominent, um, it's more in your face than it is in the genomics world, but it exists there as well. So. So we, we've played around a lot in the lab with the matrix effect for certain types of samples, and um, there's usually, we've come up with some buffers where we do pre-incubations to reduce the this matrix effect, matrix effect mm -hmm. and also bring the signal up, in particular right. with serum and other biological fluids, BAL and things, things that have a lot of fat in them. So it, there's there are ways to do this, little, right. but I'm not sure it's going to be one reagent for everything. It depends on your sample. Well, we're hoping it's it's a uh, reagent technology combination. Yep. That's what we're trying to validate now. Some we've tried and it's not fully true to claims that these small startup companies are claiming. Uh, so we're, we're well ahead of that, and hopefully this week we get more resources to get on the project. Um, just had a call yesterday, so this was perfect time to mention that to everybody, especially since I'm working on some asset development for most of you as well. So, so I just have a question for you. Uh, I mean, is it that uh, it has to be done while the sample is collected or just before the asset is run? That's what we're trying to determine. Is it at collection time? Is there that because obviously in the clinic that affects a lot of yeah. a lot of yeah. things there. Yeah. If you take a serum separator tube and store yeah, it exactly. at room temperature for 24 hours and put it in the fridge, and you have another set of samples that were treated and collected properly, that's going to cause a whole different problem. Yeah. That problem, frankly, still exists in the clinical lab today, even with all the CAP inspections. It's just unfortunate. It's things happen. But, but the thing is that I mean, when you're actually dealing with like so many patients at the same time, uh, and you're maybe you have to collect like multiple samples from the same patient. You know, it's like it depends on the study. Uh, you have pathology samples. You have blood samples. You have urine samples. You know, it's like tons of samples that yeah. well, the, the hope, nurse has to deal with. Well, the hope is is that the majority of your samples are collected uh, properly. And out of a thousand samples, if ten were improperly collected, they'll get ferreted out in the results, right? Because they'll be so far off from the norm of what every other result shows. Just to address what that Tim was saying, that you know, as regards uh, sample collection, we find this you know continuously, you know, that samples are not yet uh, collected properly. So one of the things that we've actually done is to produce training videos that we send out to the client's collection site, especially when they're in multiple countries across the world. 
And we find here that helps a lot. And we actually go every single detail from the venipuncture all the way through. Because um, it is one of our biggest unknowns, is getting samples in and X and Y just don't match up. You know, so. It's a real issue out there. It's very, very, I find it very difficult to write protocols because there's always something that you know that you take for granted. And so like a video like that would be helped. Yeah, so we've done that for several clients now and they yeah. found it also of course they translate to different languages. We're working in you know, some clients out in the Far East and that you know, helps a lot there. Yes. Yeah, I heard a question regarding the stability after plowing. Uh, after plowing, yeah, the yeah, yes. yeah. How, What is your experience on uh, So it depends from assay to assay and from the side of client or the biomarker that you're looking for. Most of them, yes, they are stable. If they are unstable, so this is what we do, that we get backup samples. Uh, once the validation is done, we'll just say, okay, the sample cannot go through a second trace stop. And uh, if we need to do a repeat analysis, we need a second sample. So we are always asking for a second sample, just in case when you do the sample testing. Um, some, I mean, it's everybody's human. The world is not perfect, and uh, you need to know that there are going to be samples where you need the repetition. So we ask for a backup sample. If during validation we figure out that the sample can go through a freestyle cycle, maybe another second freestyle cycle, uh, we still consult with the clients and say, okay, do you want it to be repeated? More questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.